Robert is a partner at Lido Advisors, a $6 billion wealth advisory firm headquartered in Los Angeles, California, where he oversees the firm's sports and entertainment division. So Robert, without further ado, I'll let you inter um, introduce today's <laughs> keynote speaker. Okay. How's everybody? Good, good. Bellies are good and full. <laughs> Settled. So uh, today I have the distinct pleasure in interviewing and doing a fireside chat. But as you can see, there's no fire, but we'll work it out. It's nice and warm. Um, I met this gentleman about five years ago uh, through a good friend of mine, Bill Bellamy, who's a comedian and actor and um, was just astonished to find out that there was someone who looked like me, came from humble beginnings, um, and owned his company 100%. Um, he's a mogul in the entertainment business. He's a maverick. He's an innovator. Um, and we've got a little clip here to show you, just so you can be familiar with who he is. In 2018, Entertainment Studios purchased the Weather Channel. Together, our combined portfolio resembles a giant kaleidoscope. Our individual parts are impressive on their own. And when they come together, our outlook is amazing. The Weather Channel. We just got word, it's a Category 4 hurricane. You know us for our severe weather coverage and our award-winning immersive storytelling. Let's lift the base of this. Every day, we have a new story to tell and a new way to tell it. We guarantee you'll learn something, and we'll also have some fun along the way. But you know who might be having more fun? Funny you should ask. Our hit game show where every question has a funny answer. Iguanas can only reproduce one month out of the year. Well, that's because they suffer from erectile dysfunction. <laughs> and the laughs just keep rolling with the biggest names in comedy on Comics Unleashed. You, ready to get your on? you don't need English to watch Spanish TV. It's exciting. The announcer make you want to see the show. You know. <laughs> Not even those comics can get one over on our judges. The drone has been assigned. I didn't see a sign. What kind of promoter are you? You're going to learn today. <laughs> the new court could be so much fun, unless you cross them. Stop. Then they dole out a double dose of wisdom and punishment. Honey, there are three sides to a story. Your side, his side, and the right side. Case closed. Comedy, court, weather. We offer a vibrant spectrum of programming spanning cable and syndicated television and mobile and TV apps featuring hyper-localized daily news and headlines you can't find in the mainstream media. And enough passion-led content to feed the soul and bring people together. We are one big weather-crazy, justice-seeking, laugh-till-you-cry, fun-loving family. Ladies and gentlemen, Byron Allen. Oh, wait a second. Come on now. Come on. Let's hear it now. Come on. This is not a tax convention. Come on now. No one died. Let's, let's do this. Here we go. All right. You guys sitting there going, oh, my goodness. Hello, Robert. What's up, buddy? How you doing? I'm incredible. Man? How are you, sir? You're going to sit right there have yes, a seat? Sir. All right. Oh, this uh. is nice. Actually, you know what? You switch me. No, 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 I'm good. You, you're yeah, a little yeah, older no. than me. You no, should probably I'm be. Look, the knees is okay. I'm a little older. I'm going to make sure the knees is, is all right. Greenwich, Connecticut. Look <laughs> at you. This is great. All righty. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, as you know, I live in LA. Yes, yes. So I way. am not used to this weather. This is the kind of weather where you just like, I'm, you say, what is going on? Is this legal? <laughs> And uh, so I am happy to be here. It's happy to sp uh, spend some time with you. Yes. Well, I think it's really important um, that we begin, to be honest, with your genesis in terms of how you grew up and how you got exposed to the life of wanting to be an entrepreneur and where you derived your motivations from. Wow. Uh, well, let's see. Well, we can, I'll get, you want the Hollywood answer or the real answers? I'm all about the real. You, know you want that. the real? Yes, sir. All right, well, then I'm going to bring real today because uh, you asked for it. That's right. Uh, you know, look, I w I'm, a, I'm a very blessed man. I'm extremely blessed. 
I, uh, my mother got pregnant with me when she was 16 years old. And she had me 17 days after her 17th birthday. And so, you know, you wouldn't bet on that baby. You know, a black teenage mother and a little black baby born April 22nd, 1961. I'm born without civil rights. Uh, you wouldn't bet on that baby. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, America's a great country. You know, um, we're, things change for us. You know, Martin Luther King was assassinated in April of 68. And I was seven years old. And I was in the... Uh, I was in the street playing baseball with my buddies. And all of a sudden, I heard my mother and my grandmother scream like I've never heard before. They killed Martin. They killed my Martin. They killed Martin. And uh, before I could turn my head back from looking at my mother and my grandmother screaming, uh, I turned my head back, boom, and I'm looking down the street. And literally, I was looking down the barrel of a tank. And the tank was coming towards me, and the, and the troops were coming towards me, bayonets, rifles, dogs. Get back in the house. This is Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan. Riots broke out. Military shut us down. Things were a little chaotic. So my mother and I, my mom said, let's go to LA, and let's visit some family. Let's visit some friends. And it was supposed to be a two-week vacation. And uh, we ended up staying. And uh, number. Friends let us sleep on their sofas, their floors, a couple of extra bedrooms, not too many. Did that for a while. And uh, my mom ended up getting into UCLA. And she ended up getting her master's degree in cinema TV production. And because she was at UCLA, she was able to get an interview at NBC to do a job interview. And she they didn't have a job for her, and she said, uh, can I be an intern? Mm. And they, they said, no, we don't have an intern program. And my mom asked a question that changed our lives. She said, will you start one with me? Mm. And they said, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and that was, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, those were thin times, I like to say. Thin times, right? My mom was young, so they talked to her about, people talked to her about not being able to afford me, all right? Um, not being able to keep me. And that's a very real thing here in America. People are losing their children because they can't afford them. And you hear that kind of conversation, it cuts to your core. And, you know, I felt like I had lost my my dad in the divorce, because he was back in Detroit, and my cousins. And I wasn't about to lose my mother. And as a kid, I remember hearing that. I was 10 years old. So I said, money won't be the reason why I don't keep my mama. So we're going to learn about money. We're going to learn how to make money right now. And I'm not going to be a burden to my mama. So I started hustling. And uh, I remember I went to Ralph's supermarket. And uh, I said, can I be a, a bag boy? Can I put some, uh, I get a job here and put groceries in the bag? And they said, how old are you? I said, I'm 10 years old. They said, you can't work here. You're not, old. You're not old enough to work here. And I said, well, how old is that guy right there bagging the groceries? They're like, oh, he's 16 years old. I said, well, look, he's putting the eggs on the bottom of the bag. And I know not to do that, and I'm 10. <laughs> I won't put eggs at the bottom. My grandmother. He'll scream at me all the way home if I put eggs at the bottom of the bag. They said, no, you can't work here. And uh, I remember walking out of the market, supermarket, and I saw this lady walking towards me with a basket. Bless you. And uh, started walking towards me with a grocery basket. And then I saw her put it in a machine. And she got a stamp. And I said, ma'am, what is that? Mm. And she said, well, they don't want these grocery baskets all over the parking lot because they're denting the cars. And so they, they, they give you a stamp. And if you get 100 stamps, you can get a dollar's worth of food. So I started working that, that parking lot wow. and getting stamps and bringing home, bringing home food to my mother because I wanted her to know, don't worry about me. I'm never going to be a burden. So I just started hustling right then and there. And I used to go out with her to NBC. And, uh, that was an unbelievable blessing, because I was able to wait for my mom to get off work as she gave tours, 
and I would sit there in the corner, and I'd just sit there in the corner, and I'd watch Johnny Carson rehearse and do The Tonight Show. Mm -hmm. And I watch Red Fox do Sanford and Son, yeah. and Flip Wilson do the Flip Wilson show. And I watch Bob Hope tape his specials, and George Burns. I watched an unknown sportscaster do the local sports on KNBC, mm. Bryant Gumbel, mm. before the Today Show. And I watched an unknown weatherman do the weather in LA, Pat Sajak. Mm. And I thought, what a wonderful way to go through life, making people laugh, making television. Uh, before that, I wanted to go to uh, work with my dad and my granddad in Detroit. My dad worked at Ford Motor Company uh, for 30 plus years, and my granddaddy worked at Great Lake Steel for 30 plus years. These guys, you know, put on a uniform every day, and I just want, and they just tried to figure out how to put 36 hours in a 24 hour day, and I just wanted to go to work with them. But then I found a different kind of factory, a content factory, a comedy factory, and I thought, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. I'm gonna make people laugh, I'm gonna produce content, produce television and I'm gonna do it for the world. Mm. And that's when I had that epiphany and it changed my life. And uh, I was fortunate. Uh, there was a comedian on the Gladys Knight and the Pip Summer Show, mm. Gabe Kaplan. He did stand up, told me to go to the comedy store. I went to the comedy store and I performed. And I was 14 years old. And uh, I did my first routine. Mitzi Shore, God bless her soul, she put me on stage. There was literally four people in the audience and 200 empty chairs. And I said, well, I guess I gotta figure out how to make empty chairs laugh. <laughs> and uh, I did the routine, and then this guy came up to me, uh, and he said, who wrote those jokes? I said, I wrote those jokes. He says, those jokes were funny. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that was the intent. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I'm sorry, you only had four people and 200 chairs. I go, yeah, you know, those chairs, they're a little fickle. And uh, <laughs> he goes, listen, uh, I know somebody like, might like wanna, they may wanna write some jokes with you. Can I get your phone number? I go, sure. I said, what's your name? He said, Wayne Klein. I said, all right, Wayne. He said, give me a call anytime. So I get a call like a week later, and this guy calls me up. He goes, hey, can I speak to Byron? I go, this is Byron. He goes, my man, Wayne Klein, says you're funny. <laughs> and if my man, Wayne Klein, says you're funny, then you must be funny. I said, well, tell Wayne I said hello. I go, who's this? He goes, this is Jimmy J.J. Dynamite Walker. <laughs> I said, hey, Jimmy, I love good times. He goes, do you want to come right with me and my boys? I said, sure, let me ask my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, oh, man, he's got to ask his mom. <laughs> And then I heard this smart Alec in the background say to Jimmy, tell his mom not to worry. We'll have some cookies and milk for him. <laughs> I'm like, who is that knucklehead? <laughs> so I was embarrassed, and my mom let me go. My mom took me. And I walk into Jimmy's apartment. And sitting in his apartment is David Letterman, hmm. who had just driven out from Indianapolis in a red pickup truck. Wow. And he drove out because he didn't think he was going to make it. And he wanted to be able to get back in his pickup truck and go back to Indianapolis. Mm. Jay Leno was sitting there, and he was sleeping in his car. And Marty Nadler, who went on to write and produce Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days and Wayne Klein and Jeff Dungan and Jeff Stein, who went on to do amazing sitcoms. And I walked in. They said, have a seat. So I had a seat. It was just like this. We're in Jimmy's apartment. I had a big afro, I looked good. I had, uh, <laughs> I had plaid pants, and you know, Letterman was sitting there with shorts, and he had some Indianapolis you know, University shirt on or whatever it was. And I sat there and I started writing jokes with these guys. And they taught me how to write material and really do it in a way that was just on point. And I just was able to do it with the best. Leno, Letterman, Walker, Marty Nadler. Leno and, 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 and Letterman were getting $200 a week. That's what Jimmy paid them, 200 bucks wow. a week. And he paid me $25 a joke. So uh, bless you. I sold my first joke to him, and I was able to quit my paper route and for 25 bucks. And uh, I was getting half a penny a paper to throw the Herald Examiner. I had to throw two newspapers to make a penny. And uh, so I quit my paper route. And uh, I, I still have that check that he wrote mm -hmm. me hanging in my office, wow. that $25 check, because that check allowed me to quit the only job I've ever had. Wow. Because everything from that moment on has been 
absolutely what I love to do. That's it. I I've never well. worked another day in my life. So uh, that was really it. I, uh, I was been really fortunate. I ended up doing The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I ended up being the youngest comedian to do it with Johnny. I was 18 years old. Wow. And I did it a couple of weeks before I graduated from high school. I thought it was going to help me get a date to the prom, and it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it always comes back to go, a woman. Oh, uh, yeah, always, always comes always back to a woman. It always back. does, right? And so um, I ended up doing The Tonight Show, and I ended up getting a number of offers. And I'm very numerical mathematical and so my agents put in front of me these offers and at that time in 79 and it went really well with Johnny Carson I was very comfortable there because I had grown up in the studio mm. literally hours and weeks and days waiting for my mom to get off work and uh, I used to talk to Johnny Carson when he would pull up he would pull up at 2 o'clock like clockwork in his parking lot mm. and I'd always position myself to be near his parking space when he pulled up act like I was doing my homework right. and he looked hello Mr. Carson <laughs> and he knew me by first name hello Byron mm. I said, hey great show last night sir mm. thank you that was a funny monologue sir mm. you got it thanks sir I got to talk like that was my that's my man right. I love Johnny right so I said look let's do this show and they said why this show I said, There's only, there are only three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, 66 hours of primetime television. This is the only hour out of the 66 hours that's different from the others. And they said, OK, it's kind of risky. I go, no, no, this show's going to work because it's different from the other 65 hours. Mm. And they said, OK, we'll let them know you're going you're gonna to do this show. And it was real people. And real people gave birth to reality shows in America. And it was on NBC from 79 to 84. I said, this is the perfect show. This allows me to uh, do this show, be on television, and go to USC film school at the same time. Wow. So that was it. So I've been really fortunate, really blessed. And what changed it? Education. Mm -hmm. Education, my mom getting into UCLA, that changed the trajectory of our, of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, real people was great. It was a great experience. Took me all over America, because uh, I really got to see America, not just LA and New York, and then you fly over LA, and you fly over America. Mm -hmm. I'm in Coast in Ohio, Waterloo, right. you know, Iowa. I'm in Bangor, Maine. Like some towns that have three, four hundred people and no stoplights. Mm -hmm. And you go and you are in the community. You're hanging out. You're sitting on the porch drinking lemonade. Mm -hmm. You really get to know America, and you get to know the way America thinks. Forget LA, forget New York. It's what's in between. Mm. That's what's running things. So that was a great experience. Um, and then I had a contract dispute with uh, real people. And, uh, and I didn't like that feeling. And for a minute there, they fired me. And it was the worst thing that ever happened and the best thing that ever happened. And I said, OK, but I ended up getting a job back. And I said, OK, let me learn this business. Mm. Because at that moment, I knew when I was young enough where it was the best thing to happen. I was 19. I said, I'm going to learn business show, not show business. So you went away from being and, a creative yeah, to like, now really understanding the principles of business that's that it. govern it. A lot of people want to be in show business. Exactly. And that's not going to, that's like, whatever, go be in show business. You want to be in business show. Mm -hmm. You want to know the business side innately. Mm -hmm. Once you know the business side, I can literally, I mean, I have 65 shows on the air, right? Because <laughs> I know the business side. Right? We have 10 networks because we study the business and we know it innately. I know it like breathing. So I really just studied the business. I, made, I went to my first television convention in January of 81. I was 19 years old and I uh, was at the New York Hilton. And I said, and this is a big TV convention and I've gone every year since then. So I've gone 38 consecutive years. And I've just made it a fact, I just made it a simple mission to know everybody in the business mm -hmm. and for everybody in the business to know me. Mm -hmm. So all the people who own and operate TV stations and ad agencies. And uh, I said, who's the best in the business? And they said, Al Massini. And I said, what floor is he on? It was at the New York Hilton. My offices are across the street now uh, in the old ABC offices at 1330 Avenue of the Americas. So it does come full circle. So they, they said he's like on the 45th floor and I, went up to the 45th floor and I walked in and he was standing there and he was bigger than life, Al Massini, full of confidence. And he's selling this television show. And he says, this is the greatest TV show ever. 
I've got the biggest movie star in the world on my pilot, Burt Reynolds, mm -hmm. on the set of Smokey and the Bandit. <laughs> and he says, this show's going to be the biggest show ever. And they said, what's the name of the show, Al? He said, Entertainment Tonight. Wow. So I watched him sell it in January and put it on the air in September. And uh, he went on, went on to do Solid Gold, Star Search, Lifestyles of Rich and Famous, uh, the first miniseries, syndicated miniseries, mm -hmm. A Woman Called Golda about Golda Meir. Just amazing. And I walked up and I introduced myself. And I said, I understand, uh, I said, uh, you're, under, you're Mr. Al Massini. He goes, yes. I said, I understand you're the best in the business. He said, yes. I said, my name is Byron Allen. And I'm here to be the best in the business. So I'm here to learn from you. So where are we going to have dinner tonight? <laughs> he kind of laughed. He's like, I like you, kid. Like, and he became like a second father to me. Well, you, you were intentional. Oh, yeah, I was intentional. You know, he was just a great guy. Uh, you know, got married four times, really loved the ladies. And, uh, and he never had kids. And I ended up becoming like the son he never had. And he was so gracious with me and so loving and sharing with me. And he just, he took to me, and I was fortunate in that regard. Mm -hmm. And he just said, you are an unbelievable salesman. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and he always said, he's, he said things to me. I'll never forget, it was, it was interesting, it was uh, emotional for me because uh, he was the first person inducted into the Broadcasting and ha uh, Cable Hall of Fame 29 years ago. Wow. And uh, they just inducted me last week. And I said, uh, <laughs> and I said, you know, I appreciate this, you know, you know, not because you inducted me and I appreciate that more than anything, but I, what I appreciate is that God gave me such a, phenomenal human being in Al Massini is that he told me 29 years ago I would be here and every American needs that. That's right. Every child in America needs that person who loves them, nurtures them, appreciates them and invests in them. And, uh, and that was it. So I was very fortunate and, and that uh, you know he came into my life and helped teach me the business and I started my company from my dining room table because uh, he told me I should. And I started my company from my dining room table, and I started by calling every television station in the country to sell my first television show. And I had a TV show where I was interviewing people, uh, a bunch of movie stars. And uh, Tribune had said to me, if you get 75% of the country, we will advance you 400 grand, and we will sell your advertising time. I said, no problem. All you want me to do is get enough TV stations to carry my TV show to represent 75% of the country, I'll do it. So I sat at my dining room table, I called all 1,300 TV stations, asked them to carry my once a week show that had 14 minutes of commercial time. I would keep seven minutes, you local television station, you keep seven minutes, you sell your seven minutes to local supermarkets and car dealers, I'll sell my seven minutes mm -hmm. to Johnson & Johnson and Pepsi and General Motors and McDonald's, and that's how I will pay for the show. And literally, I got about 50 no's from every television station. I got about 50,000 no's to squeeze out 150 yeses. Hardest thing I've ever done in my life, sit at a dining room table from sunup to sundown, for over a year, just about a year, and, and clear that show. And unfortunately, uh, when I got that done, um, Tribune said, we changed our minds. Wow. We're not going to give you that $400,000 advance, and we're not going to sell your advertising time. And I went, holy moly. Mm. I'm not going to call my mama and tell, say that. So, <laughs> so um, and, and it was a very pivotal moment for me, because I remember, I remember two weeks earlier, Two weeks earlier, I was speaking to a television station, WHP, I still remember it, WHP, the CBS affiliate in Wilkes-Barre, I think it is. And uh, I said, you know, my mom was doing my paperwork. And I said to my mom, you know, hey, mom, I noticed that, the, uh, that you didn't put the, the, the clearance of the CBS affiliate in Harrisburg, you didn't put it on the clearance list, and I only go after the people where we have holes. And I noticed that you didn't plug that in. She says, I don't have the paperwork. The paperwork, I don't, I don't have it. I'm like, Mom, you can't misplace our paperwork. These are hard deals to get. So I called the guy back, and I said, hey, Bob, it seems that my executive assistant has misplaced my paperwork that we've agreed on. He goes, no, I didn't send it back. I go, what? You didn't send it back? He goes, nope, nope, nope. He says, some guys were in here from Paramount Studios. And uh, they came in to see me. And they told me you were calling me from your dining room table and that you were in your underwear and that that show that I 
bought from you, that show was not going to show up and you weren't going to deliver that show. And if you did deliver that show, it would be on the air for maybe two or three weeks and then go away. So I gave the boys from Paramount your time period. And I said, really? Wow. I said, OK. I said, so listen up, Bob, let me ask you. I said, let me just say this. Yes, the boys from Paramount are right. I am calling you from my dining room table. And I am in my underwear, because <laughs> I don't have an office, Bob. But they're wrong about one thing. I'm going to put the show there, and I'm never going to cancel it. And I'm never going to put them in a position where they can walk into a TV station anywhere in America and say that Byron Allen's show won't be there. Tell the boys from Paramount they got this one. They'll never get another one. And because of them, I will never cancel that show. And that show will be on until the end of time. My grandkids will end up hosting that show. Mm -hmm. So just let the boys from Paramount, Paramount know they got that never again. He says, I'll let them know. So fast forward, Tribune said, we're not sending you the money. And I thought about that conversation about the boys from Paramount. Mm -hmm. And I said, for me to have credibility with these television stations, they have to depend on my word. They have to know that my word is better than gold. Messini and my mother taught me that. Mm -hmm. Never doubt my word, ever. So I said, I'm going forward. I didn't have two nickels to rub together. I didn't even know how to sell advertising time. So to pay for the tape, to pay for the satellite, to pay for the cameraman, there were days I didn't eat. There were days they turned off my pay phone. They turned off my, this is before pay phones, they turned off my phone and I had to call people from a pay phone. Um, it was tough. Uh, I had to, I used to, uh, uh, <laughs> my home went in and out of foreclosure maybe 14 times, I don't even know, over about a four year period. My credit was so bad, people wouldn't take my cash. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> that was uh, good. One. That's true, uh, and I didn't know it was bad until I went to go get a car. They were like, the guy laughed, and uh, and uh, he actually said, "I'm not sure I can even take your cash." So. Uh, I, you know, it was just tough. Mm. It was just really tough. And I had a great lady at the bank. I think she worked at Bank of America. She was great. She was like, hey, honey, your desk, she was really sweet. She said, hey, honey, your file keeps coming on my desk. What's going on? <laughs> and you know, my mama told me, just always be honest, tell it all, tell it early, be truthful. I said, well, ma'am, I'm trying to fund a television show. I'm trying to pay the cameraman. I'm trying to pay satellite. She goes, oh, I get it. She goes, I know you're telling the truth because I've never heard that before. <laughs> she said, so listen up. She said, whatever you do, don't let it go past day 89 because it will stay with me. But on day 90, it goes to Agnes, who sits next to me. And you don't want to talk to Agnes. <laughs> Agnes is not very nice. I said, OK. And I put it on my calendar every 89 days. <laughs> and I played the float. And that's how I paid for my tape. And that's how I paid for satellite. And uh, finally, I went to all the heads of the movie studios. And I said, it's not about me. It's about you. Here's my value add. I'm interviewing all your movie stars, Tom Hanks, everybody. You name it, Tom Cruise, whoever, uh, Julia Roberts, Denzel Washington, your movie stars, for an hour. I'm having your movie stars on. I'm selling your movies. And I need you guys, you, you spend 200 to 600 million a year each, and you don't spend money with me. Please spend some of your ad dollars with me so I can be there to support you. I'm a one hour commercial, go to the movies. Hmm. And they said, okay, and I signed up all the movie studios. And then after I signed up all the movie studios, I had that epiphany, it's about, not about me, it's about you. How I'm, I'm here to make your business better. Uh, that was the, first. Th that's it, value first. I'm here to be of service to you. Once I solidified the movie industry, I went and did the same thing with soft drinks. Went and saw all the soft drink companies. Then I went and saw all the pharmaceutical companies, and then the, all of the packaged goods companies, and all of the automotive companies. And now I looked up, and I was like, wow, I'm in business with every television station in the country, and I'm in business with most major advertisers. And then I just kept smiling and dialing, dialing, and smiling, smiling, and dialing. And next thing I know, I had over 40 television shows and the largest privately held television library in the world. And, and I just said, OK, what's next? Well, it, it seems like you took <clears throat> not even knowing certain principles that we deal with in the venture and private equity and high structure finance world right. and technically applied that to being able to roll up certain assets in those relationships within television. That's exactly right. And, then, and I knew 
I knew that I can't just sit here. I, my thing is always about growth. It's in my DNA. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when you think about the automotive industry, the car is never good enough. They make a better one every year. That's just that heart wiring we, we have as human beings. And I remember I was in New York and I was reading in the New York Times that they, Verizon was going to spend $23 billion to lay fiber to the home and bring tele, cable television to the home. And they were going to offer 150 HD channels. So I went to Verizon and I said, hey, I understand you guys want to offer 150 HD channels. They said, yeah, that's right. I said, well, I'm here to offer you 10 of them. And they said, how many do you have now? How many 24-hour cable networks do you have now that you want to offer 10 of them? I said, zero. <laughs> I said, but before you call security. <laughs> I said, let me tell you what my thinking is. Mm. I'm originally from Detroit. I want to bring Henry Ford efficiency to television. When I did my first television show, Real People, I'd never seen such waste. I saw guys work for two hours trying to get paid for 12. That's not my DNA. So when I sent a camera crew to Pebble Beach to shoot the car show, Concourse de Elegance, I don't want them to just shoot car content for our 24-hour car network, cars.tv, shoot content for recipe.tv with all of the chefs up there at the resorts. Shoot the resorts for our travel channel, mydestination.tv. Shoot all of the pet community up. Shoot what's going on in the pet community for pets.tv and blah, blah, blah. They say, you know, we've heard a lot of ideas, but that's one of the best we've ever heard. We're not going to give you 10 networks. We're going to give you six networks. So we made history, and we launched six 24-hour HD networks. Then I went back a year later and said, I'm the largest producer of court shows. I have six court shows on the air. I like to do a 24-hour court channel. Then they gave me a seventh network. Watch and, and yeah, then a guy came to me who satellites all my networks. He came to me, and he said, can I have dinner with you? I said, sure. We go to dinner, and his company's very successful. They satellite our networks. He goes, you may not know this, but before I ran this company, Encompass Satelliting Networks, I used to be the chief operating officer of the Weather Channel. Hmm. And he says, you live in LA, and it's always 80 degrees and sunny, and you don't think about the weather. He goes, but the weather is a great business. And it's owned by a pri two private equity firms, Bain and Blackstone, and they own it with Comcast, and they're not getting along. He says, it's like the best way I can describe it, it's a beautiful home in a beautiful neighborhood in a bad marriage, <laughs> and you can get a good deal. Mm. And he goes, check, 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 right? He goes, he goes, you're really smart. You're very efficient. No one thinks the way you think and the way you operate businesses. You're the perfect person to own the Weather Channel. And he goes, and I know you're not thinking about it. You should buy it. And I st he started telling me about the revenue and the EBITDA. He's like, yeah, these guys are pulling, you know, like a couple of hundred million a year out in dividends, blah, blah, blah. I said, you have my attention. Mm. And so, <laughs> and I said, so who owns it? He goes, you know, Bain and Blackstone. And I said, oh, okay. And he goes, why did you say it like that? Oh, okay. I said, I know those guys. And he's like, oh, you know them? I go, yeah. I said, I was at a coffee shop. And I'm sitting at the coffee shop, and this guy's sitting next to me. And I I'm just friendly. Hey, how you doing? What's your name? Well, my name is Byron. What you doing? All right. And this guy says, yeah, I just moved here. And this is in, in LA at the Beverly Hills Hotel downstairs. He goes, I just moved here from New York. I go, why'd you move here from New York? He goes, I bought a bank. <laughs> I said, you bought a bank? I go, what's the name of the bank? He goes, IndyMac. I go, IndyMac? I said, I saw people on the news last night standing in line trying to get their money out of that bank. <laughs> he goes, yeah, that's my bank. <laughs> and, and then we're talking. He's like, I want to be your banker. I go, in that I bank? <laughs> What's wrong with you? And he goes, yeah. He goes, no. He goes, I'm going to turn the bank around. He goes, I got, he goes, I got uh, investors. I got Soros. I got Michael Dell. Mm. I got Paulson. And we, we raised billions of dollars. I got a backstop from the government, $10 billion. I'm going to turn the bank around. And he goes, you know, why don't we have breakfast? And it turned, I said, what's your name? He goes, Steve Mnuchin. Hmm. I go, OK. I said, all right. He goes, can we have breakfast? I go, yeah, let's have breakfast. And we go to breakfast, and we're talking. He, and we like, yeah. He goes, I'm going to be your banker, right? I go, yeah, OK. I don't have a banker. <laughs> you can be my banker. I don't have one. Uh, at that point, I had factors. I, had to, I, couldn't get a, I couldn't get an investor. People ask me, why do you own your company 100%? I couldn't get an investor. <laughs> well, and, and let me, and this is, this is no, a really important no, point. I'm going to talk about yeah. that. I'm going to talk about Nobody would invest in me. That's how I ended up with the company 100 I couldn't even get a bank loan. You know? I, I had to go to people and say, I literally paid 26% interest for the first almost 20 years of my company. Mm -hmm. 
17 years of my company. Which is predatory. Which is predatory, but I could, I was giving them receivables from McDonald's and Coca-Cola and Pepsi and General Motors. I didn't have access to capital. And that's just, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's very challenging, especially for people of color. So I just said, it is what it is, but it's not an excuse. I'm gonna take care of myself, I'm gonna take care of my mother, I'm gonna take care of my family, we're gonna get this done. No excuses, we don't run up to the wall, we run through the wall, right? So he says to me, Mnuchin calls me up, he says, I'm having my 50th birthday, I want you to come. I said, okay, so I, my wife, my, he says, you know, you have to wear all white, well, it's fine, we go, we, we go to his 50th birthday. And on one side of me, I got this guy, and I said, oh, how you doing, what's your name? He goes, Steve Schwartzman. I go, hey, Steve, how you doing? <laughs> and the other guy, what's your name? Howard Marks. Okay, hey, Howard, how you doing? <laughs> and then, you know, and Steve and I start talking. He's like, hey, you know, I really like chatting with you. Why don't we have lunch? I'm like, okay, you know, let's have lunch. And then, you know, I'm sitting there, and Schwartzman's like, you know, I got this company, a private equity, we manage like, I don't know, what, a trillion dollars, whatever it is. <laughs> And he says, you know, I like the way you think. I want you to meet with my guy who runs media. His name is uh, Peter Wallace, mm -hmm. Mike Wallace's grandson from 60 Minutes. I go, is Mike Wallace's grandson? Oh, yeah, I want to meet him, right? right? So I go meet Peter. I said, Schwartzman wants you and I to meet. So I'm sitting here talking to you. He and I just talking to each other for about an hour. Nothing mm -hmm. really to talk about. All right, nice to chat with you, Peter. I go to breakfast with Howard Marks, seven in the morning. I don't know, all these private equity guys want to have breakfast at like seven yes. in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Something about <laughs> seven. Like, so, so I'm sitting with Howard, and Howard's like, yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, wow. He goes, listen, man, he goes, I really like you. He said, you're really smart. He said, if you ever need anything, you call me. He goes, my fund is right down here. We manage about 100 billion. I said, all right, I'll call you. So I go to try and get in the process to buy the Weather Channel and the bank won't let me in. They're like, who are you? Mm. I said, well, my name is Byron. They go, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they go, well, do you have the money to buy the Weather Channel? I said, I think so. Uh, I can get it. He goes, you can get the money. No, nah, click, right? hang on. I said, All right, so I call up, Schwartzman gets me in, Peter Wallace gets me in to the process, right? And there was a guy, Sandy Grushaw, who was on the board of the Weather Channel, and he used to be the chairman of Fox. And they went to him, and he said, Byron Allen wants to be in the process? And he kind of laughed. He chuckled. He says, I don't know how to say this to you. I ran Fox. And this guy from his dining room table ate our mm. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm. We had meetings about how fierce he was as a competitor and stole time periods from us. Mm. And we had meetings on like, how to deal with him. <laughs> Let him in the process. Put him in the process. He will figure it out, mm -hmm. right? So I get in the process. And we had this uh, private equity firm. All of a sudden, last minute, they changed the deal up on us. And I don't know what that was all about. You know, like he said, yeah, this is your interest rate. But then I want flex terms. And then we can, like, we can mm. increase it by five times. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> so I said, you're out, right? And my lawyer said to me, where are you going to get 310 million bucks in, tw in 24 hours. You need to show Bain and Blackstone 310 million bucks or you're out. I said, no problem, I'll, I'll get it. Woke up the next morning, Friday, five, I, w Friday, and I called up Howard Marks. I said, Howard, we have an opportunity. Because the way I always looked at it is, money is not the real commodity. There's not $20 trillion dollars floating around. That's right. The real commodity is the entrepreneur, the unstoppable entre entrepreneur who can get that money back with a great return. I'm the commodity. Exactly. So I called up Howard and I said, Howard, I have an opportunity for you. We can buy the Weather Channel and here's where we can get it at. And it's a great price, blah, blah, blah. It was Friday morning. Howard said, don't move. And he said, call this guy. He'll be in your office on Monday. Guy came in, sat in my conference room for four hours. We went through everything. He said, this is the most amazing business story I've ever heard. He says, you're going to get a term sheet tonight and a commitment letter tomorrow morning, mm. close on the Weather Channel. So Howard gave me 310 million in one day. And that was because we had breakfast, right? <laughs> of course. At seven in the morning, it's, it's wake up and go. Waffles. Yeah, waffles, whatever, strawberries, whatever, right? So we close on the Weather Channel. And Howard gave me like seven years, six or seven years to pay him back. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I gave him the money back five months later. 
And uh, so, so I get an email from Howard. I'm going to keep this he email. I'm going to frame it. It was like he emailed like 4.30 in the morning. I'm like, what you doing up, Howard? And uh, he says, you don't know this, but we're public. You may not know this. We're publicly traded. Mm -hmm. And you are, you are a shining star in our quarterly report. Because not only did you give back that 310 million bucks, you gave it back in five months and a $30 million thank you, right? In five months. He goes, that's one of the best returns we've seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. And he goes, if you ever need capital, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you call me first. <laughs> you don't need to call anybody else. Just call me. Mm -hmm. I got you. Right? I said, thank you, Howard. And uh, so we bought the Weather Channel a year and a half ago. And it's been a great investment for us. Mm -hmm. Um, we've increased revenue. We just won our first Emmy. Emmy. Uh, we just hit our highest ratings in, since 2012, and it's been great. And so I started buying other companies. I bought, started buying TV stations, big four network affiliates. Mm -hmm. So now this is sports. Yeah, well, uh, I did that too. Well, that was different on this. Well, I bought the big four network affiliates under Allen Media Broadcasting. Okay. So ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. In the last six months, I've invested about 455 million. In that category, I plan to invest billions more buying because my goal is to be, I t when I met my wife almost 20 years ago, she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm building the world's biggest media company. See, it always <laughs> comes back to that woman. <laughs> to my wife. I said, happy wife, hey, happy life. There it is. Hey, beautiful, do you want to ride along with me? She <laughs> said, sure. So uh, we will be, uh, we, so we're going to invest a lot of capital in buying big four network affiliates. That is something that is the, the absolute foundation of our community, local news, weather, sports. So right now we own about 15, we own 15 stations in 11 markets. It's a great business. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about the regional sports networks? Yes. The regional yeah. sports networks, I did that personally, and it's the only thing I've ever done personally, because I don't, I don't like to take capital in, you know, in the debt market mm -hmm. and, and, and deploy it if, unless I control it 100%. And the regional sports networks, Sinclair is running that. And I did it personally because I have a relationship with Sinclair. I'm one of their largest providers. And that was the purchase of the 21 regional sports networks from Walt Disney, from the Disney company for $10.6 Right. But that's me personally with Sinclair, the two of us. That's not Allen Media because they're running that. Right. And I, if I take money from the debt markets, I have to be the one to carry the ball into the end zone. So, I, then no excuses. I'll put the ball in the hoop every time. So I didn't control that. I'm like, hey, if I'm passing the ball to you, Sinclair, this has to come out of me, out of my family office. And that's the only thing I've ever done outside of my corporation. 110% everything else is in my corporation uh, for me and my family. Um, so that's really it. So I've just been buying companies, and I've just been building. Um, my focus is media. I love cable networks. I love broadcast networks. I love digital properties, and we now see a pathway to double-digit growth. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. So that's really kind of where, where that's been the story. I think uh, for us, I think there's a great opportunity to, look, 100 years ago it was the Industrial Revolution. And 100 years ago, the Industrial Revolution was funded, I mean, it was fueled by gas and oil. Today, 100 years later, it's the Digital Revolution. And the digital revolution is funded, it's fueled by content. Content is the new oil. Content is the new gas and oil. And my goal is to be the Rockefeller of content. And that's what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm, I'm pushing out the content for all devices, completely ag agnostic. And, on, and that's why we own so, so many uh, platforms. So that's really it. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mr. Allen. So. What I will say, in closing, there are a lot of you here. If you ever want to chat, email me. I'm happy to chat about anything. My email is byron at es.tv. Byron at es.tv. This is a community I don't know. I've never seen all these beautiful people before in my life. So hopefully we can be new friends, and I hope everything, uh, uh, if anything I can do to help and give you advice or anything you're looking at, let me know. Thank you. Byron, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. The 2019 Greenwich Economic Forum is brought to you by Bridgewater Associates. Meaningful work, meaningful relationships. Churchill Asset Management, Nuveen, a leading provider of senior and uni-trench debt to middle market companies. 
Robeson Gray, Bright Past, Brilliant Future, Aurora Capital, Inspiring Partnerships, and Gramercy Funds Management. We are emerging markets. Special considerations to Bank of America. Life's better when we are connected. NOAA Private Wealth Management, a leading wealth and asset management service provider in China. Gotai Jinan Futures, a leading brokerage firm for commodity futures and financial futures in China. China Industrial Securities, a comprehensive financial group providing full spectrum financial services in Hong Kong. And Titan Advisors, built like a hedge fund. Special thanks to the Financial Times and Greenwich Business Institute for hosting us. And thank you to all the sponsors who helped make this event possible. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.